you know, I work with companies where they have multiple franchises and they have multiple offices. So the mothership, that home office has to be a very, very tight ship to be able to replicate that and still be successful and sustainable. Mike check. I'm good. Mic check. Mic check. You can read about success all day long, but if you don't put in the work, the mindset, execution, and the hustle behind your vision, it just remains a dream. When everything goes wrong, you have to take all the responsibility. We uncover what high-level entrepreneurs, business owners do to rise up from hustling daily. So do what you feel passionate about. Take chances. The world becomes your library to help you to become better at your craft. Join me as I share with you actionable tips to help you grow your business, learn skills, and help you level up in your self-development journey. Your number one spot for business and personal growth is the Online Hustlers Podcast with your host, Esteban Andrade. Every day I'm hustling. What's going on, everyone that is listening to this podcast today, the Online Hustlers Podcast. We have a special episode as you know, uh, the previous guests that been here, they've been so great, so good at spinning the fire, the actionable nuggets, actionable tips, things that will help your business grow. And ultimately, you will connect with them because some of them share different stories and different ways to do their business and how they grew from being a hustler to an actual smart hustler i call it this way uh where they have now businesses doing multi-millions we had tiffany high in the previous episodes steve tranks and now today we have forest blackburn and the reason why i'm actually excited is because this individual has been one of the architects that i want to say civil engineers and, and developing the, the the operations behind uh Tarek buys houses so if you guys are not a little bit aware of of this. So Tarek is very well known in HGTV um, for a flip or flop. And there is always architects and masterminds behind all these high level operations. And obviously, Forrest uh, has been heavily involved in this. So we all can recognize that from him. But today we're going to meet him and we're going to meet him in a deeper level. We're going to de- meet him when he we, he started as a young hustler and now where he's at, where he helped going from 40K to 2 million, 2 million a month on the real estate investing business and wholesaling. So I'm really excited for this episode. Let's get Forrest right in here. What's going on, my man, Forrest? How are you, man? Good to see you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Good to see you. We actually shared a, a stage on Ricardo Rosales event on the RE, real estate entrepreneurs back in Houston. And uh, man, like the things that you've been uh, doing and and moving so fast, uh, but also like you called it surgically scaling businesses, right? Uh, It's been impressive. um, And I'd love to, for the audience in here to understand who Forrest is. And uh, it seems that you came from the music industry. Well, that was originally uh, my background. I started off when I was a kid, you know, as an actor um, doing TV and, and mm. you know, a bunch of little nonsense, doing a lot of theater, traveling around the country. <clears throat> and that parlayed into the music business. Um, I was on the production side and then on the talent side. And um, I was signed with Capitol Records for a while and toured around and had some fun. But being in front of those those audiences and being able to control a crowd and control an audience and, and you know, uh, invoke emotion uh, whenever needed, um, definitely helps in the sales process. And, um, that's really kind of where I learned how to navigate people. I went to Pepperdine university. I minored in psychology. Um, that also helps in mirroring and NLP and ways to really get through to your targeted audience. And, um, in, in our case, that would be a seller, right. Or on the disposition side of buyer. Um, but those are two different, totally different animals. Uh, one's B to C, one's B to B. So there's entirely different mindset that, that, that falls, uh, you know, into those categories. Well, you're coming from the entertainment industry, obviously, and m- now mixing it to sales and everything. Do you think I did a great job introducing you there here in this episode? Like what, what's your, <laughs> what's your opinion on that? <laughs> no, I, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I definitely appreciate that. And, um, you know, that's, uh, that, that title and, and that, um, that role that I played for nearly two years, um, working for Tarek buys houses, um, 
when I first started there, um, they were kind of at, uh, at an impasse. Um, they needed to make some, some very major structural changes and that's what they brought me in for. And previous to, uh, really focusing on the real estate industry, um, I started a, a, a marketing company in 2000 and I guess 11 soft start in 2009, uh, kind of learning the ropes, but really, uh, took wind in, in 2011. Um, and I took that from seven reps to over 1500 reps nationwide and 17 franchisees. Um, it was a real sales monster. Um, um, and marketing was the the product we were selling to small and medium businesses. Um, you know, brand development, local SEO, um, very small scale stuff. This is when the term SEO was still kind of the wild west, and now it's a, an entirely different animal. But um, and that scaled very very quickly. And um, I uh, I learned what works and what doesn't work. I spent a lot of money to make mistakes and fail forward. Um, but. Um, I, I, I learned very quickly that in certain different niches, there's certain tricks and tools that you use that, that optimizes each individual industry, whether you're working with dental franchises or, or legal franchises or real estate franchises, um, there were different tools and tricks that worked, um, moving forward into wholesale and the wholesale industry, I'm fourth generation real estate. I, uh, in, in the corporate world and working with fortune 500s, there was a lot of different things that we would apply to different niches and moving forward into the wholesale industry and working in real estate investing. Um, I just found that every trick and tool that works in every singular niche, um, you put it in a blender and it really kind of has an amazing corporate layer that we can layer over um, into the wholesale industry. And I find that in most wholesale companies, whether it's a business or a company, depending on your scale and your size, um, it's just something that works. And it's a blueprint that uh, I've been able to very successfully put into play. And um, moving forward to working with Tarek Buys Houses, um, I, uh, I was able to um, infiltrate that infrastructure and, and embed that into their systems. And it was very successful. Um, we made amazing strides within the first six months. And we rode that out for a while. And I was with them for the better part of two years. And um, we, uh, um, we had an, an amazing run. And um, now uh, I took a break uh, in April from that. And uh, in June, um, I got a, a, a very um, persistent uh, conversation going with uh, from Cody Sperber and Brian Applis mm. to come on and, and do the same thing uh, with Green Elephant Development. And we're right now because it, it started in June, um, we are just now seeing towards the, the the light at the end of the tunnel on all of the tweaks and infrastructural changes that um, I had to come in and implement. A lot of things need to be shaken out like an etch a sketch and kind of reworked and re strategized. Um, but really, it comes down to building a foundation, and you cannot scale on a house of, uh, made on sand, and you certainly can't scale a skyscraper uh, on a foundation of sand. And um, I dream big, and um, I, I'm a big believer in the laws of attraction. And if you say it's going to happen and you truly believe it, everything will fall into place and it does. And um, I, I believe it so much because I've, I've experienced it so much and I've been very fortunate in being able to see things through. Um, and I'm really excited on um, where we're at right now with Green Elephant Development. Um, there's been a lot of market changes. So that's been a lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, pivoting uh, to incorporate a lot more creative finance and, and a lot more innovations and um, really uh, strengthening PPC and strengthening the marketing blade um, to be able to generate those uh, pain motivated and not money motivated leads uh, because that makes all yeah. the difference. In, in wholesale, we're, we're offering a low offer. And if all they want is a big offer, we're not really aligned in the conversation. So having pain in those leads is, is, is a major, major part. And you know, people ask me, like you said in the intro, um, about some of those numbers, um, you know, to, to make record breaking revenue, you have to have a record breaking spend and to have a record breaking spend, you have to have confidence to be able to do that. You have to do a lot of split testing. And, um, you know, when you're spending a half million dollars a month, um, to achieve over $2 million a month, um, that's kind of what it takes, but you can't just throw money at it. You have to be very yeah. surgical and you have to really analyze everything every day. Well, man, this is a very interesting because, well, you started the marketing, like you started being, uh, becoming a marketing expert and consultant and being able to grow that real fast. I guess after your music industry, after the music industry, is that, is that uh, kind of how it went? Yeah. So, uh, I was, I was kind of, uh, the music was always my passion still is. Um, but it was my vocation at the time as well. And, um, you know, I was very fortunate to get some, you know, amazing signing bonuses that I blew through very quickly. Um, I was living in penthouse, uh, hotels on sunset. Strip what's your, and what's your genius in, 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 in music? I, I love to understand what's your genius. Like, 
producer so I, I, uh, yeah no, i'm i'm a singer um but i'm a writer and i play every instrument except the drums anything with strings or keys um that's my bag but i'm a singer by trade and a writer and i've got about 220 published songs and and uh, most of my stuff is all licensed through the ufc um i was the music supervisor for the ufc for a little more than a year out in las vegas and um uh this was after uh my stint uh with capitol records where it really kind of became work. Um, my attorneys and their attorneys got in the mud on a number of different things and we got shelved, um, which means you get put on a back burner. There's no promotions, there's no tours. Um, so from that, I started working in marketing and I worked for Paramount Pictures in their marketing division for a minute, uh, for about eight months. And um, we were, there was this, this was in the MySpace days. This is even, you know, pre-Facebook. Facebook was just about to start crowning. And uh, um, we were we were getting a lot of uh, money being allocated and diverted away from bus stops and billboards with Paramount uh, for our releases towards this new medium on Google, uh, digital advertising and digital marketing through Google. When uh, the UFC called, I went out and did that for a while, and that was a lot of fun. And I was able to license all my own music because I was in the driver's seat on who I could choose. Um, smartest thing I ever did. It's mailbox money now every quarter, and uh, it's the only thing that pays me from the music that I built before. Um, so that was a smart move. But when I came back from that, um, you know, I told my fiance at the time, my wife now, um, again, laws of attraction. I said, I want to, I want to move to Laguna beach and I want to find a company, a good company to work with in this Google space in Irvine, California. And, and, um, we moved to Laguna and I found uh, a company in Irvine within a week. And, um, I did that for, I became their director of sales after about six months of, of coordinating all their offices and scaled them very quickly and, um, learned that. In that, I also learned what not to do as far as uh, lack of fulfillment on the back end and things like that. So I branched off and started my own company. So really, my training on that began in 2009 when I was done with my UFC stint uh, that ran through 2008. Um, and in 2011, I branched off and started my own company and grew it from seven agents to 15 agents. And it was crazy. And um, uh, again, failing forward, learning from my mistakes. Um, not everybody has their halo on straight when you're in sales and really finding what can be a hurt when people are over promising and under delivering, um, being able to chew out those, uh, uh, those, those franchisees from the enterprise. And I ended up streamlining. I had a, my biggest office was 280 reps. I had 280 seats outside my office door and that was my main office. And, um, I, uh, had $180,000 a month lease, uh, on this building. And I streamlined that and made everybody remote. And this is obviously way before COVID um, and uh, a decade before COVID, really, uh, or close to it. You pioneered and, um, the I, virtual, you, you pioneered the yeah. virtual type of wholesaling. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I don't know that. And that was all in marketing. That was all in, in brand development, website sales. Okay. We serviced uh, yeah. from 2011 to 2020. We serviced about 50,000 clients. Everybody got a website. So 50,000 websites. And uh, it was all through WordPress. So it was very easy for people to utilize and do, and they would That's have ownership huge. of it. Um, but I, I, I don't know that I pioneered virtual working, but I will say that when I did cut back and I did make everyone remote, um, I did find that I got much more production out of people sitting at home with a cat in their lap, getting their work done than I did having them in the office, you know, uh, uh, floating off in their mind, looking at YouTube and, and nonsense. And, um, and that, that was very eye opening for me. It also cut a lot of my overhead. Um, yes. and in that I streamlined the process and, and turned a lot more profit and I was able to, um, then, uh, bring in partners, uh, on the deal. And, um, I made an affirmation that someday I'd just like to be sitting at home watching all of this, you know, from my house on, on different monitors. And I got my wish. And for about three years, I got kind of complacent. So I got back out and became a consultant for fortune 500s and, and a lot of big companies, um, and big brands, Travelocity, UPS, um, and, uh, about a dozen of them, I suppose. And that's when I got a phone call from the HGTV crowd and Tarek Al Moose's partner, Pete. And uh, we started talking about uh, my involvement and it took wings very quickly. So you, okay. So you're coming from this basically digital marketing side and growing uh, within the music industry and having relationships with the warrior industry, which is the UFC uh, and, yeah. and, and getting uh, the mar digital marketing side just ramped up to the point be like, hey, at some point I'm going to be using this, of course, for other things that digital marketing is like almost everything here and right now in every single business. And we're a marketing yeah. agency. All right. So we are a digital marketing agency. We do 
uh, real estate investors and wholesalers. That's uh, that's our avatar, and we do PPC awesome. and Facebook ads. Um, we also help them with content and everything. But uh, I, I I obviously want to make sure that people understand that you coming from this type of background, I'm pretty sure. Uh, you already understood the virtual the virtual jobs, uh, vir- remote jobs, and being able to scale mm-hmm. that in the business level, but also how digital marketing plays a really big role into what needs to be happening. Uh, we, I actually, sure. you, I actually share uh, the build the same building as one of the biggest uh, real estate investors slash wholesalers in the country, uh, the property force. So they actually are about four mil per month. Um, that's mere, you know, property for is just basically one of my neighbors. And uh, this guy's like, have it like here publicly. We're, we we want to beat open door, right? We want to be bigger than open door. That's, and they that's spend a big about task. hundred. It is. They, they have a, they spent about $180,000 on ad spend. It's like, this is paid advertising itself and that includes ppc and facebook right mm-hmm. you yeah. you're coming into Tarek el by el, el musa um is that how i pronounce his name yeah yeah you're there good you go. el yeah. musa and you're being asked to jump in into another industry an industry never been before that's now real estate flipper like i don't know what you guys were doing uh and i see this guy everywhere i see his ads everywhere and i also he is running motivated seller lead generation everywhere. I've seen him in the past couple couple of years. So, how do you get plugged into that real estate investing side? And uh, w- what is it that you did in order to like take it from like very small revenue month to like very big revenue per month? Yeah. So, um, you know, scaling a business, um, is, is a recipe and that's going to work in, in, in any niche, um, that there is, there has to be SOPs. Um, everybody has to own their lane and be in their, their role. Um, and, uh, it's very important to have that corporate structure. Um, and that's what I find in, in this industry is, um, something that is a struggle for a lot of, uh, a lot of wholesale and, and real estate investing owners. Um, a lot of, a lot of hustlers out there got into the business and they got very lucky on a 40, 60, $80,000 assignment fee. Now they think they have a business and now they're just going to start throwing money into marketing. And, you know, when we talk about, um, your company spending $180,000 a month uh, on PPC and, and, and social retargeting, um, that is extremely familiar numbers to me. Um, because, uh, I think it's almost exact parallel to what I'm used to doing. Um, social media, if you don't know what, you know, for the audience out there retargeting, um, you know, initial targeting is something that you would look at for brand development and brand awareness, uh, for retargeting. That's really going to be a sweet spot in a one, two punch for your PPC campaigns. Um, and for me, building out the proper marketing channels is extremely important because that's your lead funnel and marketing is our ask and we don't get what we don't ask for. And the more you ask for, the more you get. So don't be afraid to spend money, but you have to be aware that you have to do it in phases and you have to try to break each phase before you dial it up so that that way you can confidently spend aggressively and, you know, not just spend a hundred dollars to make $2. You can spend a hundred dollars to make $200. Um, and you know, I don't care about the cost per lead. I care about the cost per acquisition. I would much prefer to get two phone calls a day and close one of those deals than 10 phone calls a day and close one of those, uh, two of those deals. I'm going to burn out my sales team. Um, and, um, you know, when you have super high quality leads, because you've spent the time to do that, um, your best salespeople know other best salespeople. And those people are going to come knocking on your door because they know that they're going to get silver plattered, something that is a win for them. Um, so for me, I, 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 uh, as soon as I get into a position, I've got to open up the kimono and take a look at what's going on behind the curtain and make very fast, very aggressive changes um, to be able to, to pull the right levers to, to make it all work. And, you know, PPC is, is an awesome constant medium uh, for a marketing channel. Um, I also do a lot with television. I do a lot with radio. I do a lot with billboards and direct mail. I do a lot with cold calling and cold outreach through SMS. Um, there's really no medium that uh, I haven't, that I don't do, I haven't done, or I haven't tried. And, you know, I've been fortunate enough to be in positions where um, I can get that learned knowledge and I can have that experience on what wins and what works and what doesn't um, using other people's money. And, um, you know, when you, when you, when you go into a situation where you're not sure if something like Snapchat or TikTok, um, is going to yield you a lot of leads and you can go and invest a hundred grand every month for three months to try that out. 
um, to see what works and what doesn't. Um, that's, that's, that's a, that's, that's some serious education right there. That's very expensive. I mean, most colleges are the good ones are 50 grand a year. Um, when you're spending, you know, 90, a hundred thousand dollars a month, that's a very swift education. Um, and you're not just testing, you know, you're not just dipping your toe in the water. You're, you're definitely giving a valiant effort and you can figure out what works and what doesn't. Don't be afraid to split test. That's how we learn. We, you know, we fail forward. We always learn from our mistakes. We, we celebrate our wins. And we learn from our mistakes. And, and uh, oftentimes we, we uh, don't, you know, it's like a football team looking at those replays. Um, you know, you don't show the replay where you say, you know, here's uh, number 11. They caught the ball and ran it all the way down. Let's give them applause. They don't learn from that. They say, here's number 11 when he dropped the ball because he heard steps and how to get away from that and how to move forward better. Um, so we have to analyze our losses and we have to learn from those. And that's why podcasts like this, that's why networking events and seminars and boot camps and anything really that um, you guys out there in the audience can, can pour yourself into, you're going to rub elbows with people like me, like Esteban, like people that have tried this stuff out and have had, uh, you know, um, learning from mistakes and that can save you, uh, from having to have those costly mistakes. What to stay away from? Don't touch the hot plate kind of mentality. And that enables you to move forward faster and, and scale and grow faster because you know what to stay away from and you know what to double down on. So, um, for me, that's, that's the most valuable thing is learning. Love that. Um, is there anything, is there anything you can share or whatever you can share whenever you went into the real estate space and now helping, uh, one of the biggest well-known men that obviously ladies go, go crazy for in scaling the business, right? <laughs> I mean, first of all, why, why were you chosen by, by, by them? Like, why do you think you were chosen? Um, you know, I, I, well, I'm fourth generation real estate and I think I started talking about this before my camera took a dive. Um, but, uh, I've, I, I bought my first flip when I was 19. Um, it was in Burbank, California. I paid cash. Um, I put, uh, I, I put about $45,000 into it and, um, uh, I sold it. I, I made, uh, a little more than $120,000 in profit. And I did a 1031 exchange on that into a condominium in Aliso Viejo, California, which is Orange County. Um, and, uh, um, and that's because my dad was a commercial realtor for 50 years and I had a good mm -hmm. mentor and uh, somebody in my corner to make sure that I was doing everything right. Um, I sold that house for sale by owner Fizbo for you guys out there. Um, I went outside of title and escrow. Um, I did it all myself, did the own open houses myself. Um, and that gave me a real fast, deep end of the pool knowledge, um, on how to navigate some of these things. And so I stayed in real estate and stayed investing my money. I, I also invested into some recording studios and things when I was really getting into the music business. And, um, that's the thing about the music business. You win some and you lose most. And, um, all of that money got lost. Um, so real estate's always been something that we can all depend on as long as you know what you're doing. And I knew enough to be dangerous and, um, but I really had the scaling. I'm a scaler. That's how I look at everything. And I scale sales and marketing. I scale infrastructure. I scale ecosystems and mindsets and really grow people. If you don't have good people, it doesn't matter how good your systems or processes are. It just doesn't matter. So, um, and creating that culture, if you have a great culture, I call it sticky. They're never going to leave because their job is so sticky for them. They have good money coming in. Um, they have uh, a position that they love. They have friends in the job. Um, they appreciate and respect their bosses. And, you know, for me, I say this a lot. Here's a water bottle. The bottleneck's always at the top, right? So I, I work a lot with management and C-level positions um, to make sure that that mindset and that um, company culture and core values is instilled in um, all the way down in every role, in every department, um, so that, uh, you know, the company can scale and you hold everybody accountable with SOPs. So my background is really creating those bumpers, so to speak, like bumper bowling. When we take our kids, um, having those, those, those rigid lines in there, um, you know, people drive better during the week than they do on the weekend. Why? Because they have a set time that they leave a set time. They show up to work a set road that they take on the weekends. They don't have that. Um, so mm -hmm. we, as humans, need that SOP. We need those standard operating procedures for every role and, and, and every uh, lane of the company, including management, including ownership. Um, and having that corporate layer over something like uh, wholesale, um, where it can definitely be more of a lax environment. Um, not everybody has uh, business acumen on day one um, to be able to run their shops. Um, being able to have a blueprint to success um, is something that, that I find is, is a big struggle. For a lot of people in this industry and that's really the value that uh, i think i brought to tarot buys houses and um you know i i, I we, we moved a lot of mountains 
And Tarek's a visionary. Huh. Um, and that's why he and I get yeah. along so well, because so am I. Um, but uh, I'm also heavy on the architecture side. And um, I Tetris it all together. Um, my brain doesn't turn off, unfortunately for me. Um, and uh, that enables me to move quickly and, and move the right people into the right positions uh, to be able to delegate and not have the weight of the world on my shoulders, but uh, be able to have an army of people uh, to do an army of tasks to, to achieve a goal quickly. Okay. Well, what would you consider yourself? Are you uh, like a high level consultant for companies, for CEOs? Uh, what will be your, your role? Like, is that how you, you know, I, I, uh, yeah. So I, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm a trainer, so to speak. Um, you mm -hmm. know, I, I do a lot of sales training. Sales is in my blood. It always has been, um, being able to talk to people and get through to things and paint pictures, um, you know, mirroring and, and neurolinguistic programming are all in my quiver. Um, and mm -hmm. those are things that I instill into sales teams. Um, and you know, you have different people, different styles of salespeople on acquisitions than you do on dispositions, um, on acquisitions, we have to be a lot more nurturing. So somebody who may be, uh, from a customer support background or even more poignant, somebody who's in you know, customer retention, um, is, is a good fit for, you know, acquisitions. They have to do handholding. They have to build rapport. It's a softer sell. It's B2C. On the disposition side, they are actually doing a sale. On acquisitions, we're selling an offer and we're selling uh, credibility and we're selling rapport. Um, on the disposition side, we are selling a product. So that is B2B. And, you know, you can be a lot more aggressive. Um, you can give people strict timelines. Um, you can bat them around a little bit more and, and cultivate your buyers and tell them what you expect out of them or they're off the list. Um, and I find that aggressive nature on the disposition side to be a very winning solution and the acquisition side being a much more nurturing, um, aspect. So training sales and getting that acclimated, um, TCs and understanding their roles, uh, as a, as a middle ground in between acquisitions and dispositions is very important. Um, and then you've got your project managers and they have to understand their role and their expectations all the way up to floor managers. And again, you've got your C-level positions and you know, what is, should be expected of them. And the C-level positions are often the owners. So they don't understand that the company is their boss. Um, and the company expects something of them. And um, that expectation has to be met. And if the, if the CEO is constantly out playing golf or constantly saying, hey, you take this call or you take that call, um, you know, that, that could be a real deficit to the company. So um, I train people on their roles. I train people on their ecosystems. At the same time, I'm building infrastructure systems and processes um, and really an assembly line um, around all of those people and plugging people in to their best skill sets. And anybody who has a weakness, we stay away from that. We delegate that out to somebody who that is their strength. Um, and yeah. it's just being surgical and it's studying KPIs on every role to make sure that you're, 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 you're doing the right stuff. Hmm. Okay. So it seems like from very beginning, like very young, you've been like flipping houses and you flip the house and you also have been having great mentors. Uh, but what, what do you feel like made you to be a great scaler? If that was to be a word, like a scalier, like, you yeah, know, I, I, I hear you. Yeah. I, you know what I, I, to me, um, and I know this, this, this may sound a little odd, but to me, it's easy. Um, you know, it's like Neo sees the matrix. Um, it just makes sense to me. It's just something that, that I love and I enjoy. And I just look at things maybe a little bit differently than other people do. And, um, I'm very aggressive. Um, I'm a hard closer, so I'm the same way in, in putting together a process and working with a vendor. Um, I'm the same way in training. I'm the same way in my expectations and the quotas that I put out there. Um, so, um, you know, for me, it's 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 just something that I enjoy because it's a game, and I love to win. Is there a way? And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is there a way that like you can let us or like, let us feel what you see? whenever you're coming into a business that, for example, it's making right now $150,000 a month and they've been struggling, they've been struggling coming, uh, you know, with maintaining that or maybe just scaling that past to like 5X, right? And let's say it's a real mm -hmm. estate business, right? They're closing mm -hmm. a few deals here and there. What's your surgical approach or what's your vision that you see? Your brain is giving you these signals to see this. Okay, acquisitions, fulfillment, transactions, the uh, dispositions, like how, how do you see it? Can you walk us through like your visuals towards that? 
Sure. Um, this you know, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of working, you know, pieces to a business. You know, I, I equate it to one of those skeleton watches where we can see all the gears moving. And just because one gear is bigger than another does not make it more important. Um, they're equally mm -hmm. as important to making that watch work. And the watch that works is the most valuable watch, right? So, um, you know, and keeping that accurate time, so to speak, if we want to stay on that adage, but, um, so for me, I look at every single gear um, and every role and, and every position. I listen to recorded phone calls on the sales side. I try to strengthen the sales process. Um, oftentimes, we're not locking up deals. You know, we use the word deal a lot, and I, I've talked about this a lot recently. Um, you know, we throw that around. Oh, I got a deal this week. But if I asked you, did you get a deal on that, that microphone? What am I really saying? Did you get a bargain? So the acquisitions team needs to be locking up bargains. Otherwise, the deal is not going to be sexy to sell to on the disposition side to sell to a buyer. So your acquisitions mm -hmm. team has to not be afraid to do the hard task and really negotiate. And that's why for me in acquisitions, I prefer to hire salespeople. Real estate is something that you can train on. Anybody can go pick up the three books, take the test and become a realtor. It's not difficult. It's just a time commitment. And as long as you can remember it for 48 hours during the test, you're good. Um, so real estate is something to me that can be taught. Um, there's a lot of realtors out there that I can't even believe that they're doing anything on their own, let alone being a, having a real estate license. Um, <laughs> and, but they do, they have a real estate license, right? So it's mm -hmm. not, it's not, it's, it's, it's not, you know, rocket science. We're not talking about getting, uh, you know, becoming a heart surgeon, but sales is something <laughs> that I believe is in everybody's blood. You know, uh, and a good salesperson, they can sell door to door, they can sell uh, knives, they can sell a ketchup popsicle to a woman in white gloves, they can really sell anything. So you're just changing the script and training them on on your mindset that you expect out of them to be able to sell the product and sell it straight and not over promise. Um, and right now in this market correction we have from a sales perspective, acquisitions needs to be educating their sellers. If you're not educating your sellers on the market correction, you know, for me, I have presentation decks where I cite lots of sources, CNN, Fox Business, um, uh, New York Times. These are all articles that back up this educational process so that the sellers understand that no longer does the crystal ball say that it'll be worth more tomorrow. So I'll, I'll overpay today. Um, it's quite the opposite. And um, especially on the investor side, these flippers are very scared right now. And that's why things like you hear about novations and, uh, you know, sub two, these are all things that are working right now because, um, you know, you're able to bypass those those investors, those scared flippers and get right to the retail buyers, you know, uh, on the back end of it. And, you know, you can sell them for a much higher percentage than what you would with a scared flipper. You know, flippers were buying in the low 70s, uh, mid 70 percentile. Um, now they're down um, where the wholesalers used to be at the 60 to 65 percent range. If you get to an end buyer, well, you're, you're selling it for 100 percent of ARV or damn close to it, you know, 90 percent and higher. Um, so that's that's uh, that's a great way to weather the storm during the market correction. But on your acquisition side, if they're not educating the sellers, um, it's kind of like not being able to tell the joke. The punchline is going to fall flat. So if you can educate them during the process, that punchline, that offer uh, is going to be, uh, it's going to, it's really going to ring home. It's going to be, it's going to hit the target and they're going to understand and respect um, where you're coming from. So every single role and dispositions is a whole nother animal and uh, their standard operating procedures are, are, are different than the acquisitions SOP. Um, but analyzing every aspect of your business, um, you have, and, and that sounds like a very, you know, big task if you're a one man operation, which is why you really need to delegate, um, as it demands, everything has supply and demand. Your business does too. Um, don't just go out and open up a 40 person office on day one and hire a huge staff. Your business hasn't required that yet. It hasn't demanded that of you. Add people and add departments as your business requires. Um, and those are successes. Those are wins. Those are milestones for your company. We achieved this and then grew it from there. Um, but you, you can't, like I said, you can't build a, a house or a skyscraper on sand. It has to be a very solid foundation. And you have to, you know, I work with companies where they have multiple franchises and they have multiple offices. So the mothership, that home office, has to be a very, very tight ship to be able to replicate that and still be successful and sustainable. So everything from marketing and advertising to your sales process, your sales scripts, um, your assembly line of cold callers to lead managers to lead closers to TCs to dispo, um, that all has to be a mechanized system and everybody has to stay in their lane. You don't go to an assembly line for Tesla and see the guy who's putting together door panels run over and throw a tire on in front of the tire guy. Um, the tire guy is going to get upset. That's my lane. Get out of it. Um, and what if that guy messes up? What if the door panel guy messes up putting on the tire for the tire guy? 
he paints a target on his back. He messed up. And, um, you know, people, if they stay in their lane and they own their role, they don't paint that target on their back. Um, and their business that they own, that role, um, is much more efficient. So there's a lot of training with people and culture. And then, you know, everybody, you know, gets certain certain systems and processes and CRMs in place. Um, that doesn't mean that that's going to be your system process or CRM forever. You have to be willing to change. You know, our, our phones come out with a different update all the time. They even come out with a whole new phone all the time. Well, your business should be no different. You always have to have different iterations. You have to be evolving. Um, and you have to be really, you know, you got to keep your eye on the ball. Delegating somebody in-house to run your marketing, um, you'll get eight hours out of them every single day focused on your business. You work with an agency, as I have in the past, and you'll get an hour-long phone call with them this week and them on Thursday for trying to cultivate new clients. So making sure that you have everything in-house is, is extremely important because then you can really monitor that and police that. Um, we do have virtual teams that we work with as well. Um, but I'm very choosy on those virtual teams, um, that I work with to make sure that they have ironclad processes in place on their end and that they're micromanaging their people as they need to on their end. So really it's one phone call from me to their manager with a, you know, what the hell, um, I need better numbers and then they will make that happen. Um, so Again, it's just making sure that you have the right people in place and that you can police that and you have standard operating procedures in place to hold them accountable. So until like what level would you stop outsourcing? Because at the beginning, outsourcing can leverage a lot of the time that is not there. Like, for instance, sure. hiring an agency, right? Um, and hiring an agency has that has a full team in order to fulfill to what it's needed. Let's say a PPC campaign that runs forty thousand dollars a month or something like that. And then you want to scale, but you don't have the knowledge, you don't have the media buyers to do it, and the entire capacity of running it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like, but at what point a company would have would bring it in house, in your opinion? Um, and it, I, and I guess no, apart from that, like. What would be the faces that you, you mentioned faces on the marketing side and talking here, digital marketing, right? And talking here, PPC or, or Facebook ads, whatever. Um, like when, what are those faces and when would you hire like in-house uh, if you were to hire in-house someone? Well, I, um, I, I, I tend to be um, frugal. Um, mm -hmm. on things and that, and you know, when I say I spend a half a million dollars a month in marketing and advertising historically, you wouldn't think that the word frugal goes with that. However, I streamline <laughs> everything. Um, if I'm paying a vendor a hundred dollars a month, but I can get it, I can get the exact same value from somebody else from $60 a month. I'm not going to sit on my hands and say, you know what? It's just too much work for me to save that money. I will save a penny if I possibly can, because that's going to, that's going to increase my P and L. Um, and that helps me to go and be more efficient. And all those pennies add up. That could mean that I could start an entirely new marketing channel. I could hire, I could build an entirely new department. Um, but for me, um, you know, I look at those costs, right? So if you're spending, you know, $2,500 management fee to an agency um, to run your marketing and, uh, and you're spending $40,000 a month, then you're spending $4,205, uh, $4, right? $42,005, sorry, on your, your marketing a month uh, on just PPC. $2,500 a month, uh, depending on what market you're in, could actually hire a full-time in-house employee. Maybe it's $3,500 a month for somebody that's really good. So you're spending an extra $1,000 a month. Fine. But let's look at what that actually means. With an agency, they're going to have lights and brights and overhead. They also have other clients that they have to work for. So when they are working for you day in and day out, if they're a big agency, they're also working for dozens of other people day in and day out. And how much focus are you actually receiving for the $2,500 versus the $3,500? You would have somebody in-house day in, day out, eight hours a day, and probably if they love the job that you've created for them over time. And they're going to be focused. They're going to be bringing ideas to you. They're passing by your office door every day. You can grab them. You can say, hey, I want this change done. And it gets implemented right away. It's not put on a task list. Great. I'll get with my team and let you know it should be done within a week. Um, you can move much faster. So now it looks down to that extra thousand dollars a month. How much more value are you going to be getting out of that? And how much faster can you move now that that's in-house and in-house manage um, with somebody good? And on top of that, an agency, because I've been on the on the other side of this conversation, I've been uh, the agency. And, you know, an agency never wants to show all their cards because then what would you need me for? Um, but with somebody in-house, you can actually learn their process. You can learn what they're doing so that then you know enough to be dangerous and you can manage them. And if they're not doing a good job, 
then you fire them and you bring in somebody else because you know enough to be dangerous and they're not cutting the, they're, they're not cutting. Um, additionally, some agencies want to work within their own accounts. Um, that's the danger zone, right? Because now you're investing into somebody else's PPC campaign. Somebody else is learning. Um, you need to own all of your accounts. If you don't have ownership of your accounts and you want to switch agencies, guess what? All that investment stays with that agency. They've got you, right? It's a ransom. Mm -hmm. So by having, having something in house and it's all in your accounts, if you fire that person, you own the accounts, that person's locked out and you bring in somebody else to then take over and run that, that, that account. So now you have an asset that's owned by you, managed by you in-house runs faster and has a hundred percent focus. So anytime you can get to the point where you can bring this in-house to police, great. Now on the virtual, like virtual, uh, uh, VAs and, and things of that nature, where it's a very low cost and low hanging fruit, as long as they have management to police them on their end and you're getting the results that you need, um, you know, you weigh those costs, but oftentimes, um, you know, cheap labor gets cheap results. And, you know, if you're like me, you want to protect the brand, you want to grow the brand. And, you know, if you have a bunch of lackluster people touching your customers, um, that you have a lackluster brand, you're only as strong as your weakest link. So you have to be careful and very choosy and pick your battles on who you, who you hire. Um, same thing with in-house yeah. too, right? They're representative and extension of your core values and of, of, of your company. But, um, you know, and, and having an in-house team is something that I am very accustomed to and scaling and growing. Um, and having virtual teams as I do now with a lot of different companies I work with, Green Elephant being one of them, we have an entire virtual army um, in multiple departments that excel and expand the in-house team that we have here. And I have managers in place for all of those departments. Um it makes a big difference, yeah. right? If I, if I can scale an army for, you know, three people cost the same as one person and my commission structure on the back end is nil, um, you know, it, I, it enables me to, to, to grow a lot more profit. And then I can roll that profit into another marketing channel or, you know, just scale up my current marketing and double down on what's working. Can I tell you a little bit of what we got going and maybe you can tell me, hey, look, it looks good. It looks OK. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah for sure. All right. So. Uh, so we have, so we founded a company called RemoteLatinos.com because we want, we know that there is talent in South America, Central America, like highly educated people that went and got a bachelor's degree, whether in the U.S., Canada, uh, or in their country, and they had to learn English because they had to go out of their way in order to find opportunities in the U.S. Someone like me, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. so I end up hiring people that are not in the lower level of like salary. No, you know, like not five hundred dollars, six hundred dollars a month, but like I can pay them. I can pay people that are highly qualified that have worked in maybe, uh, you know, cool international corporations, but live in those countries. That still mm -hmm. will be a good cost savings for me, but it will be really great pay for them because now I'm yeah. taking them. Uh, so, for instance, I would pay them double, triple of what like a regular person would pay a VA because obviously mm -hmm. these people are highly qualified and experienced and working with in other countries or like in an interna international infrastructure, right? Like let's yeah, say US, 100%. UK, Australia. So we do that and we are highly focused, for instance, in the Amazon method. And I call the Amazon method from, from what I learned from Jeff Bezos is that very, very, very focused on uh, customer customers, right? And customer centric. So Compared to the competition, they never look at their competition. And we have created, like, for instance, people that you you right now are saying, like, check in one time, one hour uh, a week as an agency. Well, we check on them, not only in that one hour to see the metrics, but we also have uh, Slack and, like, SMS to, like, be able to talk to them. And, like, our yep. system specialists and media buyers. Communication is key. Also in the same Slack channel and they have like a team, we call it a marketing arm, right? So that these yep. people feel that it's not just like the management, but it, they feel that they actually have a team to go to. Hey guys, look it's like- It's a community. We, it's a community, correct. So mm -hmm. that's yeah. one of the biggest, biggest differences that we have uh, because I, I've seen that different agencies, for instance, they just off, offer management and then and then the leads are generated, great, but then they they leave it up to their, that point. Like they don't support further, they uh, they don't act as consultants or like help them with the conversion process or help them with the follow-up process. So we go above and beyond, right? 
Uh, mm -hmm. But the beautiful thing is that I can do that staying still lean enough because I have uh, people from South America supporting me. And obviously I have American, American employees remotely because it's been great right. uh, just, just to stay uh, remotely. But like, what do you, what do you think about that structure? And like, um, oh, no, I, like, I think you're, you're, you're right on track. I mean, I think that that's awesome. You know, that's why you and I get along. Um, you know, you, you, you have a great mind and, and you're looking at it, you're looking at it all the right ways. Um, and you know, something that you said and, and, um, you know, I'll reiterate, um, you know, if, if I, if I go to South America, let's say, and I do get a VA from there, um, that VA could have a doctorate and I can't afford a doctorate in the United States of America to work on my team. Yeah. However, the amount of money that that doctorate needs to thrive and, and, and strive in South America is an entirely different animal. And I can make that person very happy with what I'm able to pay them. And I have that level of intelligence now on my team. Um, so, you know, you can have these, these, these people that are very, very well educated and, and uh, very well spoken, very smart. They know how to steer a conversation and I call it corralling cattle. Um, they know how to get people to the finish line. And, um, and sometimes you just can't afford that in, in the U S and, you know, I'm, I, I work in Arizona, I work in Southern California. Um, the Southern California market is, um, you know, you can't pay somebody $3,000 a month because that's not going to get their rent paid, uh, on a one bedroom apartment. It's not going to happen. So, but if you go into somewhere, you know, in Utah, $3,000 a month, that's, that, that's serviceable and, and you get a better quality person for that, for that money. Same thing going down to South America or wherever you can find, uh, VAs, um, you know, the cost is much better, but, um, you can also play with that cost, inflate that cost to get somebody who's very educated and very skilled for me. Um, I, I, I have onboarding, you know, everybody goes through an onboarding process and a training process, but, um, having somebody who's skilled and has the background to be able to navigate this stuff day one, um, that can be more expensive, right? They, they deserve a higher pay. They, um, but you don't have to be as so hands-on with them. They, they ramp up much faster and they're ready to go. So it's hard to find that in the U.S. and it's hard to scale that because of the costs involved because somebody who's very smart and well-educated and skilled is going to cost a lot of money. But you yeah, can uh, pay the price spend sure. that. Yeah, and, and that price that you pay um, you know, in South America um, is going to, to be a much smaller cost to us here but to them there, it carries weight and everybody's happy and everybody wins. So, um, no, I think that that's, that's a brilliant model. Yeah. Amazon, Amazon is, is opening, uh, offices, more offices in Colombia, for example, where I'm from, they mm -hmm. are, you know, different, like high tech companies are just expanding their, like, like one, I want to say international corporate cor corporate offices down there instead of just using them as callers they have now, mm -hmm. now individuals that would uh handle more of the higher level infrastructure which is great you yeah. know and one of uh, Forrest, you, i i heard you mention vas and uh, just back my pardon man but like i want to change the concept of what a va is and how it awesome. should be because they they call every single remote job or a remote employee that does, it could be like, I don't know, it could be a call center I hear manager, you. it could be I, I, a I systems totally hear you. manager, and they call it VA. And and the VA yeah. in reality is, it's just an admin, uh, an administration assistant, like an admin assistant, right? right? right. That, that's right. what the, Virtual the definition what of it, was right? Mm -hmm. And it will do just admin tasks. But uh, a few people here in the US, uh, it's because obviously we evolved so fast after uh, COVID about using VAs, mm -hmm. using VAs, remote work, um, that they think that people from Central America, South America, even Mexico cannot do higher level things. And yeah, to me, you're right. To me, <laughs> that's crazy. Cause yeah, like no, I agree you see so many of these, uh, Latino entrepreneurs doing great things like Carlos Reyes himself, right? Like yep. he yep. come. He comes from Mexico. And like, what if he had stayed and just learned the language? He would still be the same person. Maybe big, better access to economy and an economy that, that flourishes faster and easier. But, right? Like, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. No, I, 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 I totally do. And, you know, the term VA gets, has been thrown around and it's kind of coined for the terminology, like you said, of, of, of a, a virtual employee. But, you know, having a virtual TC is not a bad thing. Having virtual acquisitions is not a bad thing. Having virtual dispositions, you know, and, and you don't have to have your entire team be virtual either. 
You know, you can have a small in-house team and you can grow a virtual army outside of that team. Um, and that, that can help you scale. Again, it just comes down to policing and making sure you have the management, the, the proper management in place on the virtual side of things. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, everything's gone virtual, you know, especially since COVID, like you said, that definitely did force the envelope um, and a lot of businesses. And that's why office space became so readily available. Um, a lot of yeah. businesses learn that they can cut that cost and they can have people working remote. In the U.S., we call it remote. If you're not from the U.S., we call it virtual. Um, I don't know how we changed the game on that, but uh, I totally understand <laughs> what you're saying. And, um, you know, I would never I would never call somebody a V.A., that has, uh, you know, that, that is taking a break from being a heart surgeon to be on my acquisitions team in Columbia. Right. <laughs> um, you know, I think, I think that that's demeaning if, it, if we're, if we're being honest. Right. So, um, you know, there is, there is a, a I think you're, that's great. You want to change the game and I'll help you do it if I can. Um, but, uh, it, yeah, <laughs> having, having these virtual employees and these, 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 um, these people that can work for you for a great cost and, and you're fulfilling their needs and desires on their end, it's a good marriage and it's very easy to scale that, um, because it's a, it's a lower cost. It's a lesser cost on our side. So then that means we can either double down on people or we can take that overage that we're not spending and, and grow other marketing channels and, and really expand our ask so that we get more. Love this. I think we would uh, get along and we need to get that Dutch uh, Miami here in, in the next few weeks, man. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll be out there in October. I'll see you in October. Ricardo Rosales oh. and Don Costa and I are, are doing a, a mastermind in Miami, a boot camp in Miami. Um, we've got a couple of yachts. We're going to tether together and, and do it out there. It's going to be a blast. Um, and I hope you, you come and say, hi, I'd love to hang out. We'll grab dinner, come to the yachts. We'll do whatever, dude. I, I, I enjoy you. And, um, I caught you on stage, um, when, uh, we did the event with Ricardo and, um, you know, I, I, I know that we're, we're, we're cut from the same cloth. So, uh, I look forward <laughs> to hanging out. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Um, just before we go on, um, you have two more minutes. Or maybe this can be 10 minutes because I, I love that you just love giving, man. Uh, <laughs> so for the digital marketing side, and a lot of people want to scale with PPC, right? And a lot of people are mm -hmm. getting into that game more, uh, more and more. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the faces that you use in order to scale those campaigns up in order to go from, let's say, spending only $100 a day to like now thousands of thousands of thousands of dollars? So it's all in phases. Um, you know, you need to, you know, you don't just open up the floodgates and start spending a hundred grand a month just because you got a good deal and you want to roll that into, into your marketing, you know, starting out, um, you know, spending a few hundred dollars a day to a few thousand dollars a day that there's increments. And, you know, not only are you doing that with your spend, but Google has something called learning. And when you make these sweeping changes, Google goes into a two week learning pattern to learn how your spend is and to see if your credit card declines and they learn more about you and they learn more about your audience. And during that learning, they throw out a wide net. So sometimes you'll see a higher volume of, of uh, leads come through, but they're not quite as high quality as they will be once learning is over. Then that volume will kind of tighten up a little bit, but the quality will excel. Um, then you close some, you close some contracts and you get those done and you, and you prove your theory. And maybe it takes you a month to prove that theory, but once it's proven and you can count on it, then you dial it up to the next level and you do it again. And you try to break that next level and you try to do everything you can to make sure that that's a very concrete level and you're spending a little bit more and now you dial it up again. And now you're spending on a third tier and maybe you've got to bring in more salespeople and more acquisitions and dispositions to be able to service that lead boy. Um, that's fine. Your business is demanding it. So you supply it. Um, and you know, that's the ebb and flow. But you have to do everything in phases. You have to split test, split test, split test. You have to try everything. And we fail forward. We learn from our mistakes. So that's how you're able to make the hard decisions. And that's how you're able to move it to that next scale in that next phase. And once you reach an inertia of what's working, you may find that if I spend over $100,000 a month, I don't really see a big difference. Okay, well, then don't, you know, don't climb it up to 150 if it's not going to make that big of a difference in your profit margins from spending 100. Dial in another channel. Let's go split test another channel. Let's do radio. Um, let's do remnant ads. Um, let's do TV. Let's do bookended commercials with five second spots and throw in a few 30 second spots. There's let's do, um, you know, a half size billboard ads at the, at the open at the entrances to planned communities. Um, you know, let's do mailers. Let's try all these different things and split test. And yes, they cost money, but this is your education. Um, you can't say I'm not going to go to college because it costs money, but I definitely want to be a heart surgeon. But nah, I don't believe in spending money to become one. 
that just doesn't work in any environment and that's not sensible. Um, so you have to take yourself to school. You have to buy that education. Um, and that's what enables you to level up to that next phase and that next phase after that and the next phase after that to the point where you have a monstrous spend because you have a monstrous revenue uh, coming through. So, um, and, you know, once you hit a waterfall, that's kind of cool. Uh, and you can ride that out and have some consistency in your business. And that's when you can take your shoulders down. And that's when everything kind of relaxes because you're confident in what you're making. You know what you're going to make and you're confident in your process that gets you there. And back to people, you know, you have to have good culture and good people um, to be able to fil- facilitate these goals and these these desires that you want for your business to grow to. Okay. I feel like you have a, a little bit of a lot of passion about business and just uh, being able yeah. to scale businesses. Yeah, Where did that passion come from? <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm an only child, so I didn't have, you know, siblings to compete against, but um, I definitely <laughs> had to, um, um, uh, I guess it comes back to probably acting and, and being on stage at an, at an early age and being able to, needing to command the spotlight and then deserving the spotlight. And so for me, um, I, I, I work hard and fast and I'm aggressive and that's where my passion comes from. I work the best under pressure. Um, I'm a procrastinator by nature. So if my plate is completely full, um, every single task I'm working on is a last minute under pressure thing. And, you know, Cody and I, Cody Sperber, who I work with now, um, you know, we talk about this a lot. He's the exact same way. And this is why he and I get along so well. Um, you know, uh, and you know, these guys, Cody Sperber, Brian Applis, um, are, are just some of the most amazing, smart minds for creative financing and how to structure deals, um, that I've ever worked with. And I'm very fortunate. Um, the day I stop learning is the day I'm dead. And with me, learning is power, but learning is also extremely valuable. And, um, to me that, that sometimes is better than the check they can write. Okay. I like uh, I like for some people to get something at home apart from this podcast, and I feel like uh, if you could recommend a way to learn or like resources, just resources mm-hmm. for people to learn from. Um, uh, is there any books? Is there any like mentors you, or you yourself? <laughs> uh, any anything that you recommend for people to like? Get um, to I- your- I'm, I'm constantly, constantly learning and, and, and listening, uh, to different books right now. There's a book called what, what I think it's what exactly to say or what to say, uh, what to say. And it's for real estate agents. Um, don't let that sway you. It, it really applies to real estate investing as well. Um, it's, uh, it's only about 13 chapters and they're, they're fairly short. You can find it on audible. That's one that I definitely recommend as far as how to talk to folks, uh, on the sales process side. Um, but for me, it's, it's um, you know, as I got headstrong and, and 100% laser focused into real estate investing and wholesale a couple of years ago, um, learning obviously from Tarek El Moussa and learning from his moves and his partner's moves um, and another guy named Adam Lindholm over there who really is the mastermind um, behind the real estate side, learning from those guys and then also paying attention to Jerry Norton, paying attention to Pace Morby um, and Cody Sperber. And that's why when Cody called, uh, it was a no brainer for me, um, um, to go and work with him because the, the amount of knowledge that I can gain is absolutely invaluable and it's better than any check somebody could write. Um, and that sets me up for success in my future life. That sets me up for su- uh, success in, in the role that I'm in now. And, um, you know, everybody finds something different that they enjoy and the, that they'll listen to in a mentor. And sometimes you can find somebody who's got all the knowledge in the world, but you're, you're kind of deaf to what they're saying because you just don't gel with them. Um, and that's fine, but find somebody who your ears do like find somebody that your mind will remember and find a mentor that really fits what your goals and your core values are, and then learn the hell out of whatever they're saying. You know, everybody should be subscribing to Pace Morby. Everybody should be listening to sub two and Jerry Norton. Um, uh, everybody should be listening to Cody Sperber, the clever investor, um, and learning, um, read as much as you can go to networking events, talk to people. That's Brett Daniels, right? Talk to people. Um, you know, you have to learn from those around you and those that are already doing it. And in our space, there are so many, I call them gurus, fake gurus, right? They're not actually doing what they're talking about. Um, so be careful. Um, you know, you've got to know who you're listening to, to make sure that that's practical knowledge that you can actually implement into your day to day that will have a result, uh, as opposed to just lip service. So, um, listen and learn and network as much as you can. That's my advice. Um, because that's how you're going to, that's how you're going to grow. 
Okay. How is this um, how, this thing that you have in forestblackbarn.com? You're mm-hmm. coming up with something. It's uh, some sort of master course. Um, yeah. Can you talk to me a little bit more about that? Sure. This has been exciting. This has been a project that's been going on for uh, about two months. Um, I had uh, some family issues that took place uh, recently with the death of my father that kind of uh, had to take my mm. foot off the gas pedal to go through that. Um, but um, this is exciting. Um, this is, uh, I, I have a lot of students and a lot of people that I coach um, and anybody out there who wants to uh, book a call with me, I am. I would love to consult. I would love to coach. Um, you know, let's get on a call. You can find that at forestblackburn.com. Um, and then the course, uh, is coming out, it's coming out at the end of the month. And this is really a blueprint and it's a blueprint, whether you're a solopreneur and you're a one person operation all the way up to a full fledged company with departments and, and, uh, and payroll and HR and overhead. But really what it is, is streamlining the process and layering in some of these SOPs that I mentioned earlier, um, layering in this corporate structure over and above what you already have. And it's a blueprint for success. Um, it's not a magic trick to get to seven figures a month. It's not a magic trick to do eight figures in a, in, in a year. Um, it's a recipe. And if you know that recipe and you enable yourself to stick to it um, and see it through, then it's, like I said, it's not magic. Anybody can do this. I'm not, uh, you know, I, I, I don't have a wand. Um, this is just something that is a recipe. And if you can stick to it and you implement all of these things and you hold everybody accountable, you'll be able to see who your winners and losers are. You can get rid of the losers and have nothing but winners, get rid of the noise and really take it to the, to the finish line. So I'm very excited about the program. Um, right now it's on 50% off until it launches the end of the month. Um, so definitely go to the website if you're interested and sign up for that. Um, again, we have to pay to learn. We have to go to college. We have to learn what we need to do. Um, and, uh, over and above that, if you need me in your corner, um, I do coaching calls at all times, um, day and night, you can get yourself on the calendar there and I'd be happy to, to help and assist and and help you grow. Um, from a coaching standpoint, um, I do have high expectations and I do give a lot of homework and I want to make sure we're hitting those milestones. Otherwise we're just hanging out. Um, and I'm happy to hang out, but I really want you to grow because I want to hang my hat on your growth and I want to use you as a case study. So it's important for me to help you succeed and help you win because um, I hang my reputation on it. And um, it's important for me to not only help you as a friend, but also um, it's important for me to let others know that it's working so that then that credibility lends so that I can help more people. Great. I love that. If you guys been listening to this episode closely, um, please just share it away with your circle, people. Uh, leave a review if you loved it. And uh, let me know what you think about Forrest Blackburn. Um, visit his website if you feel that you're in a point in a business where you may need some uh, master course or coaching from him also reach out to him he in forestblackburn.com he's been able to provide a link there just to book a meeting that's great would that be you or your team my man that's me that's uh you're, you're gonna get me and then you know if we need to dive into marketing and then we need to do ndas and and kind of open up the kimono and take a look at your adwords accounts and, and shake them out like an etch sketch or pull levers to make them better um we can do that we can explore just about anything um i can take a look at your scripts i can train your salespeople. um let me know what you need and that'll happen in that first consulting call when i figure out more about your business then we can launch into a coaching and we can do that at any time there is no you know, right or wrong way to do this. We can have a phone call once a month. We can have a phone call once a day. Um, it really depends on how aggressive you want to be and how quickly you want to learn. And um, you know, where, where you need me most, um, I, can, I can help. So, And I do have a huge marketing department and a huge marketing team that have been with me for a decade. Uh, they go everywhere with me. And um, they are a big part of, of my success stories. Um, and uh, I always step out of those conversations and let you work with them directly so that we can implement some of these changes to help you grow and and move faster and stronger. Well, you've heard uh, Forrest, uh, he's a a great business authority. You guys have seen how he's been able to master the, uh, uh, you know, from Tarek by houses to now uh, elephant development, right? Green elephant development and Cody Spring. Green elephant development, yep. Those are great names and great companies that make a lot of money, a lot of revenue. So. It's definitely good to like, you know, just uh, cross and and do some shoulder rubbing with him. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I'm going to Miami. <laughs> so I'm not missing out on that, man. I'm, I'm in Miami. I look, I look I'm forward going to, it. to the jet. But <laughs> good, nice. I love it. Yeah. 
Yeah, man. Uh, well, thank you so much for being here, man. We're going to end the episode here. So is there anything that you like, you know, maybe just suggest to, to any listener or anything, any advice whatsoever, uh, just to crush it, keep crushing it? Well, I assume that your audience, most of them are, if they're not already involved in wholesaling, they're, they're heavily involved in wholesaling, or they have at least taken the first step. But for those of you yes. out there who are considering getting into wholesaling, don't be shy. Okay. This is, this is real estate's not going anywhere and there's no, there's nothing nefarious about it. There's nothing negative about it. You don't have to lie. You don't have to be, um, transparency is the biggest thing that I can tell everybody. If you're transparent with your sellers and transparent with your buyers, if everyone's educating everybody on exactly what it is, um, that's, that's really the most crucial aspect. If you're doing novations, which is a whole nother training episode, you want to be transparent with your sellers. You need them to understand what you're doing. Subject to, you need transparency. In any sale, even the cash offer, they have to understand why your offer is what your offer is. So make sure you're educating everybody you're talking to. Build rapport. Spend time on the phone. That's your shot. Don't take a 15-minute phone call. Take an hour and 15-minute phone call. Um, make an impression. Right. Build that credibility. Let them think. Let them hear how you think and how you operate and how genuine you are. Uh, but be genuine and be honest. There's nothing to hide here. And on the disposition side, don't tell people that oh, I'm, I've got a plumber coming out and that's actually your buyer. If you're upfront from the very beginning, you you can tell them. Listen, I don't know if I'm going to buy this or not. Oftentimes, because you're outside my market, I will partner with one of my partner investors because they get better labor than I can, better labor costs, and it just makes more sense. So I may have one of them pop by just so that I can try to sell them on coming in on this deal with me. So keep it clean, keep it tidy. Uh, they'll be coming by at two o'clock. Then they're not sitting, well, I think that was a buyer. It's not a plumber. And you're not lying. There's no reason to do that. So be honest, be transparent, um, be upfront, be educational, um, be likable, be trustworthy, be credible. These are all things that will make your business thrive and thrive. And um, that's that's really kind of a, a grand scale overview. But um, the biggest thing is make sure there's infrastructure, make sure there's parameters. People love to have a lane to stay in and keep them in that lane. And if they get out of that lane and you train them to stay in it and they're not listening, chew the fat, get them out of there. Don't be afraid to sacrifice one to save the many. I've, I've gotten rid of my best salespeople just because they were, I call it pissing on the sales floor, just mm -hmm. so that they, the, they didn't make it negative, right? So... Make sure your company is an awesome culture. Um, pour a lot into your people. Give them bonuses. Give them spiffs. Take them out to lunch. Bring in lunch. Do anything you can to make your company sticky so that they'll never leave. Um, offer them tiered bonuses. If they're there for a year, their commission structure goes up. Make it a long-term marathon and not a sprint in every role, and your business will thrive and, and, and succeed for, for, for long into the future, right? So, um, that's, that's the best uh, advice I can give. And just don't be afraid to fail forward. Try things. Even if you don't know it's going to work, you don't know if it's not going to work, try it. Um, and if you lose money on it, well, you didn't lose money. You gained knowledge. Um, and now you know what not to do and what to do. And that's going to enable you to move forward faster. Man, this is huge. Thank you so much for being here. And I'd love to have you in a second episode. Maybe we can dig into specific topics. And and yeah. I just get there, man. I just love the the fact that you that you're coming in here with that attitude of just giving, and uh, I I love hanging out with those people. That's why we're gonna uh, I'm gonna get you a shot when you come here if you're still if I, you're drinking. Hey, <laughs> I, I, hey, what time is it? Um, uh, no, thank you very much for having me. I would love to come back. Um, and um, yeah, I will definitely see you in Miami. And um, everybody out there, thanks for watching. And I hope you got some value out of this. And again, if there's anything else that I can further clarify for you or um, you know, help you move the needle in any aspect of your business, reach out. I'm attainable. And get yourself on my calendar so it blocks out some time for us to sit down and I can really hear you. And I can hear what your needs are and what you need to do in your business because I would love to help. And uh, I would love to be part of your success story. All right. Thank you so much, Forrest. And thank you for everyone listening awesome. here. Remember to give us a review. Uh, and uh, see you to the next one. Yeah.